Okay, welcome along to uh, Melbourne to Osaka fifth webinar. Um, and for people that listen to this later, welcome you as well. Tonight's pretty interesting. We've got, it's very much a medical and uh, emotional health night. We've got Dr. Rosie Callahan with, her, with us and we have Darren Egger. And we will introduce them in further very soon. As with other webinars, I'll keep you muted just to keep the noise down. Uh, and we'll try and do some questions along the way with the chat function. We will open it up to questions along the way. And we are recording, as I said. Just a very quick general update because we want to get into the, the, the guts of today. Um, we've got 29 entrants. We've had a couple who have pulled out, mainly for medical reasons, uh, which is disappointing. But we did actually expect that to happen. We don't have any on the wait list anymore, which is interesting. Um, can we mute, please? The draft sailing instructions have been published, uh, which is good. Hopefully people have seen those or had a bit of a read. Any questions, let us know. We called them draft. Um, they, they will probably uh, change and evolve, but um, we'll have a next update will be the final for those. We're going to have a notice to race amendment too to formalise the news we let everyone know, particularly around the HF radio. And there's a, a couple of other items there as well, which we're addressing, um, all fairly minor. So look, in the next week or so, you should see that come out. You would have seen, uh, it was on the website, I believe, the Gill clothing. There's some fantastic looking clothing uh, relating to the event with the logos and everything on that. Uh, and there's going to be some discounts for competitors. Uh, we will send a, an email out to competitors on how to access that discounting. But the Gill clothing can be purchased via the website at the moment. So friends, family, that sort of thing. And some fantastic looking stuff. Uh, Robin Brooks going to be putting together her newsletter very soon. Um, we do need content. We love talking about the race and talking about you guys. Uh, but we do need to know about some of these stories. So please let us know. The last but not least, um, we have calculated start times based on, I guess, a reverse performance handicap, if you want a better word. So we'll be able to let people know their start times. Um, there's the three dates we have published, and um, we'll allocate votes into those three start times and publish those as well. All right, I'm going to uh, hand over now to uh, Dr. Rosie Callahan. Rosie's a general practitioner. She also competed in the Melbourne to Osaka in 2007, so she's very knowledgeable about the actual race and what it's really like. Uh, and in 2018, um, for this race, she's our Chief Race Medical Officer, and she'll have a team of medical officers supporting her. So I'm going to hand over to Rosie. Okay. Good evening, competitors. Uh, nice to be in touch once again. Um, six months out, the uh, timeline's getting shorter and shorter. So our theme for tonight is really looking at um, crew uh, health issues and also uh, keeping the crew emotionally healthy um, in the lead up to during the race and post race. So our theme for tonight is to start fresh, fit, informed and relaxed. And remember, this is an endurance event, not a sprint race. It's not what you're used to doing around the sticks. So tonight we're really going to focus on how to keep body and soul together and get yourself through this. Okay, preparation. First thing is to think, plan and then do it. And now is the ideal time to start. Um, it's pretty imperative at six months out that you make an, um, a plan to go and get your medical issues sorted out to sort out whether or not you are in fact fit to undertake the event. Um, there's some other preparation you need to think about with when you're on the boat and going, <coughs> travelling through the event. Um, nutrition and hydration are absolutely uh, fundamental to the success of you having a successful campaign. Um, take your own bottled water, don't rely on the tank water use your own water bottle so you're not picking up germs from someone else's and make sure that you increase your quantity of um, fluids when in the tropics. Uh, sleep is another issue which is most important. Your circadian rhythms are going to be um, disturbed and depending on what rosters you're running, um, 
you need to get into the habit of sleeping that roster and waking up fresh and relaxed uh, if you're going to be able to function well because basically doing an Osaka race is sailing solo with sleep. Um, you also need to be prepared for environmental conditions. Most of us who live in the southern states are well um, exposed to uh, the risks of hypothermia in Bass Strait and going south to Hobart. This time you're heading across the equator and into the northern hemisphere. The water temperature at the equator can be 31 degrees. The humidity is 100%. And being able to look after yourself during that um, is uh, critical to you actually being able to complete the race and certainly to be able to keep your mental faculties alert at all times so that you can be making good decisions rather than making um, very flaky decisions about what you should be doing. Uh, the seasickness, of course, is a, a big issue that can affect your um, not only your sense of well-being but also your capacity to be a, a contributing member to the club of the crew, so that needs to be addressed. And the other thing is to um, consider the risk of infectious diseases on board. If you go aboard and you've got the flu or some sort of respiratory infection or you've got gastro, it's highly likely that your co-skipper um, could pick that up and you could wipe out both crew and you don't have a reserve plan. Um, the other thing is being very careful about food preparation and storage. Um, and be aware of the risks of food poisoning on board. Um, with regards to injury, look around, look and see what the hazards are that you have on your boat and how you can minimise hazards and um, uh, that will mean then that you have a good injury prevention program in place. And then the other aspect that we need to talk about, which is uh, pivotal to uh, having a successful campaign is stress management and emotional regulation and our psychologist Darren will discuss that a bit further down the track. Okay, so first of all, what you need to do is visit your GP now and have a check-up. Um, we've already had this week, um, last hurrah, have notified that after um, 18 months of finding the boat, two years getting the vessel ready. Uh, they have now been knocked out of the race by the need for Peter Bush to have a knee replacement and he's been told by his uh, medical advisors that he won't be fit to do the race. And it's not the first time that they've contemplated doing it. So it, that brings in another whole emotional reaction to I've set up to do this and it's been taken away and I've not we're six months out, I've got nowhere near the start line and how you might deal with that. Um, the other thing is to check out your existing chronic medical conditions, have them reviewed, get them stabilised if they're up, down and not quite as well managed as they should be. Make sure that you um, get uh, enough uh, prescriptions which will allow you to take your regular medications and have some spare ones in case you've got to get them a life raft and maybe put them in the grab bag. Uh, you need to check out the stability in hot climates. You may need to change to a slightly different formulation uh, to make sure that your drugs aren't going to go off in the heat. Um, safe storage is essential on the boat. And the other thing is we need is an action plan for managing adverse events. So if your condition does deteriorate or have an exacerbation, your co-skipper must know where your medication is, how to administer it, and um, that you're both comfortable about what needs to be done to keep you well on the boat and in the race. Uh, the other thing is have a skin cancer check. Uh, now, because if you're going to have any, if you need any skin cancers treated or removed, it does take six months for the scars to settle and new scars are much more likely to take up uh, solar damage and hence make sure they're well and truly healed. And the usual thing about making sure you put your sunscreen on. Um, the other one is a travel consult, which is separate from your general medical issues. And that should be done a minimum of six weeks prior to departure. 
uh, at looking at immunisations for preventable diseases. And for those of you who <coughs> might be travelling back through the Pacific, there may be um, malaria prophylaxis requirements. Uh, the Health Department just this week put out a um, notification about there's been an increased number of notifications of hepatitis A, which is the infectious hepatitis that causes the gastro-like illness. That's um, spread by poor hand hygiene. So I would recommend to everybody who's uh, going as co-skippers that you both have Hep A immunisation so that you can minimise the risk because Hep A lasts six weeks, so you don't want six weeks of diarrhoea and people who aren't functional on the boat. And the other thing that's um, really important and should be done now is to get a dental check because teeth can really be the root of all evil. Um, they can harbour uh, life-threatening infections and unfortunately in our practice in recent weeks we had a 56-year-old man who turned up as a new patient, hadn't been feeling all that well, a bit short of breath, was sent off and found that he had a septicemia, which is a blood poisoning, and he, the bugs that actually attach themselves to his heart valves. And unfortunately, after two weeks in hospital, he died. So um, trying to manage something of that magnitude out in the middle of the Pacific, is the outcome's not going to be good. So go and see your dentist now. Okay. Um, some of the health risks associated with this is seasickness and the effect that it can have. So take your own supply of pretrial medications. Um, how effective the drugs are varies from person to person, and in some people the side effects of the drugs can be disabling, and if it prevents you from being able to read your charts or that you're off balance and you don't feel comfortable about leaving the cockpit, that can have implications. I always start the you have seasickness medication 24 to 48 hours before departure or if you're out there before the bad weather arrives and continue for 24 to 48 hours afterwards because you really need to preload. Otherwise, if you just take it when you start to feel seedy, you're likely to vomit it, you won't absorb it and you won't have enough on board to get a blood level that's going to be effective. And just remember, any oral medication vomited within 20 minutes um, has not been absorbed, so you've got to take another dose. Uh, the other thing that's going to be a big issue out there is sunburn. So a big hat with a big brim is a good idea. Um, sunscreen <coughs> must be applied 20 minutes prior to exposure to bind the skin, otherwise it's not going to protect you. If you need to use mosquito or insect repellent as well, put it on top of the sunscreen, not under it. It'll prevent the sunscreen mining. And I highly recommend chapsticks for lips because most of the time you're looking up at sails and a peak cat doesn't always cover the lower part of your face. And now's the time to have a really um, good long look at how you're going to provide shade and shelter options on the boat because when you get up into those um, tropical conditions, um, you can fry pretty quickly at 6 o'clock in the morning. So. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you, you're well covered for that. And of course dehydration is a, a big issue as well. If you've got your own water bottle, you can measure how much you're having each day. I'd recommend about two and a half litres minimum a day. Um, but of course if you're vomiting or a lot of sweating or whatever, you need to have more. And also carry electrolyte replacement fluids or powder such as Gatorade, Hydrolyte. Uh, particularly if you're vomiting, those that have got more salt and sugar balance in them um, will increase the rate at which you absorb the water from your stomach. And even if you're still vomiting, just keep pouring it in because eventually you will um, you'll win the battle. Okay, nutrition. This is really important from a, a psychological point of view as well as maintaining your physical strength. Um, trial the meals repeatedly well before departure because once you get out into the Strait and you decided, my God, I hate this freeze-dried stuff and you're not at Cable Island and you've got another three or four weeks ahead of you, you're going to get palate fatigue and that's not going to put your head in a good space. Make sure when you have meals that they are proper balanced meals, that you have some protein um, which will sustain you longer than carbohydrates and you need protein to maintain your muscle strength too. And a lot of people find that being on a boat for that long period of time, they often lose quite a lot of muscle strength because 
you're doing specific stuff and it's good for your balance, but you're not always doing muscle strengthening um, type exercise. Um, and the other thing is make sure that you take some treats along and snacks and supplements that are easy to um, access uh, to keep you, you trucking through the night or um, trucking through the day. Again, onboard illnesses, if one person gets sick, you've just got to be meticulous about the hand washing. Um, using the alcohol-based hand wash is a very effective way of doing it. Um, and the other thing is uh, if someone's got a respiratory illness, having a face mask or even putting a hanky tied on or whatever over the mouth or just coughing into your arm rather than your hands um, or using dirty hankies um, is a way of trying to prevent the second person going down. And what about all those well, you know, good luck kisses and hugs when you leave it? <laughs> yeah, <up>. exactly. <laughs> then you go aboard and you actually get out your <laughs> alcohol <laughs> wash and you get rid of all those those uh, special oh, things that they gave you as like you departed. Your ass. <laughs> Wipe it off. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that if you're visiting destinations, which is more likely after the race, but occasionally some people have to go in to be able to effect a repair or um, get extra fuel or whatever, um, traveller's diarrhoea can be pretty debilitating. So there will be a drug on the list for... Uh, taking some antibiotics to deal with that if you get it. But much, just be really cautious about if you rock up to the local village and they've been cooking chicken there all day, probably don't eat the chicken or don't eat the pig because it's probably been um, humidifying and just growing bugs all day. What about Gardia? Um, Gardia from the water supply, if you take water on in those sort of places too as a an issue. And then, of course, the other um, very important thing is your emotional health needs to be in balance with your physical health. So keeping body and soul together, I'll hand over to Darren. Thank you very much, Rosie. All right, just to introduce Darren. Darren's a clinical and organisational psychologist. He's a pretty keen dinghy and keelboat racer. Winner of the Welburn Hobart. Well done. What year? Uh, 2004. Well done. And he's a national judge and umpire, and that's what he's been doing this week. So I'll just hand over to Darren. Welcome, Darren. Thank you very much. Right. I uh, just wanted to uh, touch on a couple of things. Um, we've, we're how, how, how far oh, are we we're, out now? We're good. We're good? No, in terms of uh, before the oh, race. Oh, before the race, we were six months. Six months out. So six months gives crews a really good opportunity to – in the lead up, not only prepare themselves um, physically, um, and as Rosie's pointed out, there's a number of health issues that need to be attended to, prepare their boats, but also spend some time working on their emotional and psychological well-being, not only individually, but also as a team. And tonight I just wanted to touch on a couple of very quick things uh, in relation to that. Um, think about it as your psychological toolkit. Now, you can think about this in three distinct phases. There's the pre-race preparation, which is the phase you're in at the moment. There's the preparation that you need to put in that'll see you through the race. And also, not to forget, probably one of the most important things is the post-race debrief, how you deal with some issues that might crop up during the race and that may need a little bit of resolution post-race. But for now, let's focus, I think, tonight on the preparation in the lead up to the race. So preparing psychologically um, is an acknowledgement that every team that is out there is going to be a unique combination of individuals. How will you know each other uh, is of critical importance before you head away from the dock. For example, um, how well do you know each other's mindsets, which includes such things as do you have a tendency to focus more on the negative than the positive, the old glass half full versus glass half empty, for example? Um, what's your default under pressure? We all have it. Knowing what your default is is of critical importance to yourself and to your crewmate. So you spend a lot of time and effort uh, planning and preparing. Um, learning about each other's personalities is an important part of that prep. There are three probable key things to think about uh, in terms of a successful team. Uh, key attributes. Trust predictability, 
and resilience. And I'll quickly touch on all three of those very briefly. In terms of trust, think about it like this. If you were to grab a piece of paper, draw a line down the center, and on one side list all of your strengths, and then on the other side list all of your vulnerabilities. How comfortable would you be doing that? More importantly, how comfortable would you be sharing that with your crewmate? And that's the task I'd actually challenge you to consider undertaking. Everyone's a combination of their strength, strengths and vulnerabilities, and it's the vulnerabilities that are going to catch us out the most uh, at times when we're least uh, expecting them to. The other thing is that understanding these things is about building uh, trust. And one of the key things about bu building that trust is feeling share, safe to share those vulnerabilities with each other. Predictability, which is really an extension of that, is understanding and knowing the patterns and of each other's uh, behaviour. Planning for some of the things that uh, you've identified might come up for you and develop some strategies and putting them in place uh, well in, in, in advance of when they might, might arise. If you can predict some of those patterns in advance and work the, with them, then they won't catch you by surprise. They won't draw your focus away from your shared objective, which is something, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but fundamentally, something that you should both be very aware of what your your key objectives are when you go into this race and what you're hoping to achieve by, by completing it. The last one is resilience. We all have our wobbly moments. You will have wobbly moments out there. Don't, ex don't expect to be the exception to the rule. So plan for them. No matter how good, how good you are at, at your planning, You'll also come up against stuff that you just can't plan for. There'll be unexpected things that pop up, and they're going to test you. And this is where your resilience comes into play. One of the things that is fundamental to controlling yourself or helping yourself during these times is to understand how good you are at controlling your focus. One of the things that unexpected situations do throw at us is distractions, things that draw our attention away from what we're actually out there to achieve, what our objectives are, and it's our ability to haul our attention back on course, control that focus and get back in the game that allows us to manage those, those challenges that we encounter as we uh, go through the race. So in summary, I guess what I'd, I'd like to challenge you to do over the next couple of months as a crew is to do a little bit of homework. There's a number of things that you can do. For example, difficult conversations. One of the things that you'll note when as you lead up to these events is that we're really good at talking about all the good stuff. All right? We can have we, we can anticipate the, the shoving off from the dock, we can anticipate the race, but more, more importantly we can visualize getting to the finishing line. All right, but there are going to be some things that crop up or need to be attended to, which involves having a difficult conversation. Most people are not good at them, so practicing them in advance is a really good thing. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is to discuss and agree your race objectives. Now, that sounds a little bit silly, but it's amazing how many people have slightly different goals and ambitions for what they want out of the Osaka race. Now it's okay for them to be slightly different, but know them in advance and make sure you can agree on a common set so that you, you ensure that you're on the same page. The second thing uh, is I'd like you to consider sitting down and talking about how you both see the world. And if, if need be, write down how you perceive things a little bit, talk about how what your worldview is and share that with your, your crewmate and uh, have a little bit of a chat over a, a quiet ale and, and see what you how well you know yourself and how well you know each other. <coughs> Thirdly, that list or that sheet of paper I described earlier with the strengths on one side and the vulnerabilities on the other. I strongly encourage you to sit down, prepare that, and share that with the person you're going to share the boat with for an intense period of time. 
And lastly, spend the remaining months thinking about some of these things and bring them back possibly. I'm more than happy to come back when we get together possibly in February. And if you've got any questions or issues or, or um, even tips and suggestions, bring them along and we can share them with everybody. It's a good idea. Um, we're going to have questions in a minute, but we just thought we'd just cover two last things. Um, and I might hand back to Rosie for this. One's relating to the medical kits. And I don't know if you've seen already, but on the website under race documents, and I think there's a category of called other, we'll move it, but there's a um, there's a spreadsheet. And what that spreadsheet is, is the modified medical kit. Which this race is a Cat 1 Plus, but Rosie has modified that list for this race. Okay? So that's, um, and it's got some explanations as to why something might change or what might get added. And it's a very comprehensive, well thought out list. So I'd encourage you, you, you need to look at that because that is actually the list that um, our auditing team is going to be working from. Is it Rosie? Okay. Well, um, now we've uh, actually got to the start line and you're out there uh, doing your race and um, we need to be prepared for the unexpected um, to manage what can happen and keeping yourself in the race and hence we carry a medical kit on board and the contents of which will be more extensive than what you're used to um, having on board if you do a Melbourne Hobart, Sydney Hobart race because it needs to reflect the different um, conditions you'll be travelling through and the different um, types of injuries or illness that you may experience. Um, along with the prescriptions in, published in the sailing instructions with regards to the medical kit requirements, there's also legal requirements for prescription drugs that are governed by international maritime law um, about carrying drugs for ship supplies. And also in Victoria, our state law of drugs and poisons, um, they have a protocol for the lawful supply of Schedule 4 and Schedule 8 poisons to racing yachts. Uh, that is, that document is actually on the uh, website and there is also a list of um, participating pharmacies. The, this legislation allows you to take a copy of your entr entry of race, um, a, your passport or driver's licence to prove um, who you are, along to the pharmacy, and uh, they can directly supply you with medication. You don't need to go and get it from your GP, and in fact it's not legal for the GP to write it. GPs can only write prescriptions for medications when they've examined the patient, made a diagnosis about the disease, and then written out the instructions for that one patient. So um, don't prevail upon your GP to get that. Get on to um, getting them from the local pharmacies. And the ones that are listed are, are used to doing it and are very helpful. Um, additional things, suturing, stapling and dental kits, um, they'll be able to be accessed through the ORCV. So that's... Um, just prior to the race, yeah. Yeah, just prior to the race. You don't need it until that time. Um, and the other thing that I recommend, you'll find that your medical kit will be quite um, expensive by the time that you buy splints and expensive medications and wound dressings and things like that. So what I suggest is you actually have a simplified day medical kit that's in an easily accessible area. And in there, just put the things you need for immediate pain relief, your Band-Aids, bandages, sea sickness medication, cortisone cream, um, and if necessary, a couple of um, sachets of gastrolite. So then you don't have to raid your main medical kit, um, which once people start going through it, stuff gets thrown everywhere, and often a lot of the um, dressings in that can be damaged. An entrant should expect when they get to Japan that they will need mm. to actually give up some of their drugs to the local authorities, yeah. and then they'll provide them back to them before they leave mm. Japan. Yeah, the Schedule 8 poisons, which are the um, opiate painkillers, they will be removed and lock, kept locked at the Yacht Club. And as, when you leave Japan, they'll be returned. If you need any um, uh, strong painkiller medication in Japan, you'll need to go and see a doctor in Japan who will 
then uh, access it through the appropriate channels for you. Okay, now the other thing is medical incidents on board. Um, there's a protocol that's been developed by the ORCV. There's an ORCV medical incident form for reporting, which will be um, accessible through the website. Suggest you download a copy and print out several copies. So the first thing is in the event that you have an incident, stabilise the casualty and fill out the ORCV incident medical form with as much information as possible. This also includes where you are lat and long, what boats might be within VHF range, what HF channel we could receive you on, um, and uh, if you're using a different phone, yeah. SAT phone mm. and you've listed another number, please let us know because then if you drop out, we need to be able to try and get back in touch with you um, to make sure that we uh, can keep up giving you advice and check that everything's going according to the plan. Um, and the, uh, it's, the requirement is you actually call a duty race officer, it's not the race medical officer, and they will contact the person who's actually on duty as the medical officer at that time um, because we need all the communication to go through one person um, rather than having multiple people working. Yeah. Um, That'll be via the race director phone, which are the numbers in the sailing instructions. Yeah. Um, and then uh, what we'll do is get you on those crew on the boats to transfer the contact details and observations to us so that we, the duty um, medical officer, will write all that down and then they'll advise you as to what the diagnosis is, what the plan's to be. Um, They'll advise you to keep observing the casualty, how often, what we need to know, and then make an arrangement, call back in two hours or call back in four hours or I'll call you back in um, six hours and, and we'll assess, reassess the situation. The other thing is notification of next of kin is really important. People often, when they're filling out their forms, will put down next of kin, which may happen to be their wife. If their wife may be in transit to Japan or otherwise their wife probably doesn't want to know anything about this crazy idea that they've been nagging them about for years. And so there may be somebody else who's a, a good family friend who's a sailor and understands who might be the best person to break the news that someone's had an incident on board and, you know, they've broken their leg and they're being medically evacuated out rather than ringing the wife. And um, so we, we usually check at that point who is the best person to manage this whole situation within the family and make sure they've got support at home about dealing with this outcome. Um, and then there may be um, arrangements made for medical evacuation if needed, depending on where you are. And the ORCV does record all incidents um, that occur while ocean racing and the purpose of that is to use de-identified data um, just to get a register of what are the most likely injuries that people have sustained um, and what is the best way through the sea safety and survival training that we can help to minimise those risks and make the, spa the, the sport safer. Okay, now come February, um, we'll require all crew to fill out a confidential crew medical questionnaire. Um, that information will be viewed by the duty medical officers and that information is kept confidential and used only in the event of an incident. In the event that you get medevac off the boat, um, that will be shared with the people who are doing the medevac and then whatever um, medical facility you go to but otherwise it's completely um, confidential and it doesn't get shared with anyone else in the race management team except the doctors. Yes. All right, so our offshore first aid seminar is going to be on the 28th of February. It's not a compulsory. It's a, it's a training session which everyone's invited to, that the competitors are invited to. It'll be in Melbourne, most likely somewhere in Sandringham, but venue to be, to be um, confirmed. A fair bit of it's relating to how to use this medical kit. It's got an awful lot of stuff in it, including a lot of medications. So we want to make sure that people know how to use it. And there's going to be some hands-on instructions. So Rosie, I don't know if you want to preempt that or just say watch this space for now. 
uh, yeah, it'll be um, much more practical and it'll be looking at things like managing fractures, dislocations, how to clean a wound, address a wound, make sure mm. that it actually does what it's meant to be doing. Um, and then we do a sewing and suturing session as well yep. um, to get everyone hands on and the big strutters or the chicken wings yeah. will be out. And, and this is as well as it. a uh, first aid certificate. You, you still need your first aid certificate. Yeah. Uh, but this is as well as, and it's not compulsory. So what is the actual first aid requirement? Uh, it's the, the first aid. So the so question question for the computer was what is the actual first aid requirement in the notice of race that requires a senior first aid? Senior first aid. Yeah. I just see my Oh, and um, at that point, hopefully Darren will be available to help us uh, review these plans that he spoke of earlier. All right, so just look, wrapping up, um, we've got a few. If we unmute people, they can uh, ask questions or you could type them in the chat. Hopefully Todd, Todd Gerardo sent us a question relating to how do you get these suturing and dental kits. I think we've answered that now. Uh, if someone, anyone else would like to ask a question, please do. Otherwise, we'll close for today. Can I just ask, um, with your first aid certificate, which lasts for three years, if you are not within that first 12 months of the three years, do you have to do the CPR? You know, how you're supposed to do a CPR? You should be doing it annually. Yeah, I would rec highly recommend um, that everybody renews their CPR before they go. Yeah. It's not a notice of raise. That is a life and death thing. Yeah. So it, it, critical that everyone is proficient and up to date and some of the things that you may have learned before about giving rescue breaths that's now out there's no rescue breaths uh -huh. so it has changed subtly um, I mean if there was enough people we could probably look at doing a CPR update at the time that we do the hands-on seminar in February but that doesn't cover your whole senior First aid no, well, certificate. For Joe and I, both our senior first aids are current, but we're not in that first twelve yeah. months. So, All right. So for the computer, there was a question around um, the currency of C uh, the first aid, particularly CPR, and the answer was that CPR was was highly recommended. We may look at doing something, perhaps if enough people are interested. But uh, the level, the, the senior first aid is a requirement. Show Rayson's asked, is there a costing for the medical requirements? In other words, the kits. Um, last time I set up a Sydney Hobart kit, it was about 400-ish. So I'm guessing this will be about four to 500. Yeah, some everything. of them will already have some of the things yeah. like um, the... Uh, Bandages and whatnot. Yeah. Yes, and the splints, the air splints and mm. that. Um, it'll be mainly the cost of the medication and the additional antibiotics yeah. and things that and painkillers. Yeah. We'll get that just in time. And on, on behalf of the ISOB, for those that are going to be doing the West Coaster as a warm-up, we will amend the notice of race to allow the Osaka kit in lieu of a, a normal Cat 1 kit, so you don't have to go and buy anything else. Todd Gerardo was saying his update was around 850. Okay, that's quite a lot. Um, mine was a lot less than that. But, yeah, I guess it depends on how much you're updating and what level of stuff. Mm. Any other questions? Okay, we can always have a follow-up. Um, you can contact us, um, Melbourne Osaka team, at any time in the committee. If you've got any medical questions specifically, there's a medical um, email address which goes to Rosie and there's her phone number there as well. And also Darren's been kind enough to put his email address and his phone number as well. Um, the forms are all accessible uh, through the Melbourne Osaka Cup website. They may, for some of the forms, lead you to the ICB site, but it's fairly obvious which ones are which. All right. Well, I'll thank you all for your time. I'm going to close this now. Uh, we've gone a little bit over time, but I think it was well worth it. So good luck with your preparations, and we'll see you in Melbourne.